In this video we're going to show how to upgrade an Amstrad PC 1640 uh, IBM compatible from 1987. These were very popular machines in the UK. I had one growing up or my dad owned one and we all used it. A uh, very nice machine. Revisiting it again, I was surprised at how well built it is. It's a Korean build made uh, from plastic mainly on the outside but actually it's really well built. I found it uh, a real pleasure to work on. Um, I've got three of these machines uh, and here's one I'm upgrading for uh, an office use. Um, so I found them to be really well built, um, really nice to upgrade and nice to work with. Um, and once they've had a few upgrades like the compact flash hard drive then they're very nippy as well. So in this video I'm going to show you the upgrade process, I'm going to have a look through with you at the components I'm going to upgrade it with. Uh, going to go through the hardware build, uh, software setup um, using the Amstrad software and then I'm going to cut to my own build that I've kind of been working on using a, a later version of DOS um, and then I'm going to show some software and some games uh, that I have in, enjoyed using on it so far. So uh, let's get started. So here's the main board here. So it's an Amstrad PC1640. Um, I originally got this off eBay. Uh, it's it's nice condition. The only thing about this particular board is that the the mouse input for the Amstrad original mouse doesn't seem to work on it. I've changed with a different mouse. I've tried various things. I've traced back the connection from the mouse connector um, all the way back through some pull-up resistors into uh, this chip here. Good connections, but there's something. And I've also replaced a few of these. Uh, disk capac capacitors that were cracked as well in case that fixed it but no um, just doesn't work so luckily the serial connection at the back here works beautifully with a mouse so that's one upgrade is a serial a new Microsoft serial mouse that's actually quite a nice comfortable mouse to use as well uh, through a, a DB9 to um, I think that's a 25 pin a serial port that's on the back of the machine, so, but that works well with the Microsoft driver. So that's that's one upgrade. Um, I've got originally it came with um, it came with a floppy drive, five and is it five point two five inch floppy drive um, with uh, edge connector. Um, so that's going to stay with it as well, uh, but I'm adding a GoTech um, floppy emulator basically, and this was quite a difficult model. This one I had to upgrade the the firmware. It wasn't kind of their recommended model to get of the GoTech, but I did this, and it put flash flop, floppy on it basically, and that worked really well as well. Um, and the, I guess the main upgrade actually is probably this thing, which is an XT IDE BIOS. Now a few people on, on YouTube had, had talked about adding this to the uh, PC1640 and I was really worried about how easy that was going to be but I was really surprised about just how well it has worked really. Um, you have to kind of get it into one of the your good um, uh, ISA slots on the board. Sometimes you have to wiggle it a bit but once it's seated well it works really well. So. Uh, this one here is from a, an eBay seller, AA Pro model. It's called. It comes. It comes with the XTID BIOS pre-programmed on the on the on the chip here, the microprocessor. So that's good. And it's got some switches down here for various uh, BIOS configs as well. So I've got it set to Amstrad Buggy, I think, at the moment, um, and that works well as well. And then connected to that is a Compact Flash, um, 128 megabyte Compact Flash, and that works really well as well. In fact. You have to use DOS 5 for anything above 30 megabytes. That's what I have installed here because I, I prefer kind of the environment for DOS 5 as opposed to DOS, is it DOS 3.1 or something like that, 3.11, um, which, which is what Amstrad originally shipped with on its system disk. So I've kind of installed DOS 5 and then I put some of the Amstrad drivers back on in order for the uh, some of the, the, the various tools to work on it like the display for example so that's that's a key thing so I don't have a hard drive in this one anymore in fact I don't think originally this one did have a hard drive it was uh, two well it says single disc doesn't it but I think this one actually came with a floppy and a, a, 
a three and a quarter inch as well, but I'm going to go for a GoTech in that one. Um, and I've got a, a drive bay adapter here I've managed to source off eBay. I think you can probably find these elsewhere. I paid probably over the odds for this, but at least it matches the nice beige colour here. Um, so that's going to look good to fit the GoTech into it. I uh, haven't tried that bit yet, so anything might happen on that one. Here's the um, the original shield, the uh, radio frequency shield. A bit bit rusty, but it'll do fine. Um, and then what else do I have here? I have a um, a sound blaster CT thirteen fifty B. So that's a nice uh, eight bit sound blaster card. Works well on the XT machines. Great for, and also this one actually has the chips for um, Game Blaster as well. So I don't have to, you can, instead of using Adlib sounds, you can use the sound Game Blaster sounds from Creative as well, which is really nice for playing games like uh, Arkanoid 2 or Monkey Island. Uh, really nice, very nice indeed. Um, I've got this HDD clip. I didn't talk about this previously actually, but this is something I've got recently from, uh, from a seller, I think in Germany or maybe the Netherlands. Uh, you kindly sent two of these, um, and this basically you wire this up to your HD light on the XD ID or the original HD, and it just makes clicks basically, uh, uh, so that you know the hard drive is working. It's a little fancy novelty, I suppose, but it's, it's quite nice to have when it's ultra silent from working off compact flash. Then hearing the odd click from the hard drive is kind of reassuring to know things are working or loading or whatever it might be. Um, I've got the original, well, uh, yeah, A original, this, mind you, it's got the same branding, hasn't it, which is the kind of the filled grey lettering, so it maybe is the original keyboard that came with it, lovely, great condition. Um, and then also, what have I got going up here, here's the mask cover of that one. I've got, well actually these two kind of come together really, which is that I have got um, PC ECD screens and also a, a mono, monochrome display screen as well original CRT um, which I've featured in another one of my videos which works really well but for this particular unit actually I wanted to be able to just wire it into kind of a, a multi-computer uh, keyboard video monitor setup uh, and use a normal LCD modern LCD screen with it um, I've got a few sync masters that will do the job really well um, so so in which case I have got this thing here, which is an uh, uh, RGB to HDMI converter. Uh, so into it is a serial connection, and I've got a serial lead, or an EGA lead, should I say, but it's basically serial, isn't it? Um, that goes into the back of the uh, this computer. And then this uh, Raspberry Pi and a, a special in-out board on it, and a special chip. I forgot the name of the chip, but it converts it. Um, it captures each frame from the EGA and it converts it to a HDMI signal basically. So that works really well. And alongside that, because the quirk of these machines is that um, when they design the machine, the power supply for the main unit for the computer actually is, is housed within the, the, the original CRT monitor. So um, in order to do away with the CRT monitor, I'd need to find an alternative power supply. And this is what I have here. Now this, I've reused a, a case from a, a small a, micro ATX power supply, but inside of it is, um, oh, I forgot, I think it's called Universal PSU from a website which is about replacing Apple II original power supplies, basically. So inside it is a, 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 an up-to-date power supply, brand new, um, and then I've uh, rigged up a, um, I think this is 15 pin or something connector which is basically fits the same as this. So that was, that was sourced off eBay and the power supply was sourced off their website. So that's kind of the nice upgrade here. Nice quiet fan in that too. Um, and I have tested it all out in isolation. No doubt I'll have some problems along the way, but I'm gonna now install it inside of the, the case. So I'm gonna to start to put it together and putting the main board or motherboard into the bottom of the case. It's a bit tricky to fit together here. Now I have actually got rid of the um, RF shielding here, which I found to be a bit of a pain to fit. And I don't think it's really needed. I've still got it, but I've just decided not to put it in here. Um, so I've done a slight adaption to the, uh, the, the, um, the floppy drive cable here. Um, I've just extended it a little bit because I found I couldn't get it to reach the back of the GoTech. 
so I put a, a little extension on by way of fitting a few together um, so I'm just going to screw the motherboard in into the bottom here yeah I found the uh, shield just a little bit tricky to fit together with it so I've left it out Fitting the PC speaker into the side and plugging it in. Uh, trying to route the cables, and that's the power LED you can see in my left hand. I'm just getting everything kind of neat and plugged in. Oh, a few cables will not come up. So this is the uh, five and a quarter inch floppy. Now this needs to be the A drive. It always expecting this unit to be a 360 kilobyte floppy. Um, and they tend to always go on the right hand side. Um, and then the GoTech's gonna go next to it in the B drive position. And for that, like I said, I need to have a little extender just to fit to the end of the, of the GoTech. Uh, because it's shorter than an original floppy which might have originally had that place so that fits in there roughly and I think I'm sorting out the power supply for the GoTech here with a bit of a splitter uh, trying to neaten things up a little bit and the power back of the floppy as well screwing them in. Now this machine did have a few non-original screws in it which seems to be looking at other builds often it has kind of domestic screws instead of the original screws but that seems to be fine. Um, and that's roughly it. So they're plugged in. Now this is the XDID. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to test it first of all before I build it all. So I'm just plonk, popping in the XDID uh, interface card with a compact flash um, extending out of it there. And uh, that's the clicker which plugs into the light socket on the XTID and that makes a clicking noise every time the compact flash is, uh, is read or written to. And that also requires a power as well, Molex power. So. I'm going to give this a go and just see if it works. Here's a monitor that I've got handy and there's the power lead going in now and then that's the uh, EGA connection going at the back of the machine and the keyboard going in. So I think it's just nice to be able to test things a little bit, particularly making sure that the floppy drives are set to slave and master in the proper way number zero and one and it says please wait at the top of the screen there and it I don't yeah I have got the speaker plugged in so it might make a ringing noise maybe the volume is turned down so yeah the XCID has been recognized there because it's got a little banner at the top of the screen that appears and it's also found the compact flash at the master position so this is actually a, a, a an installation I've got from a different machine on the compact flash there. Um, but yes, he's working so far. And that's the clicker working there as it as it accesses the compact flash. That's all good. I'm just gonna just check the A drive now. That's all good. And finally, I'm going to try out the, uh, the GoTech, which is the B drive. Yep, likewise. 
So that's looking okay. There's the power switch at the back of the monitor, which turns it all off. Okay, I'm gonna do the final build. So I'm um, gonna attach the uh, clicker for the hard drive to somewhere safe inside the case. So I've got a bit of double-sided tape. Now that housing for the GoTech, I found it was a bit high actually, so after I fitted it all together I wasn't happy, it didn't quite fit together as well as I wanted it to, so I've had to do a bit of an adjustment since uh, to lower the top of that GoTech by basically cutting the top off it. Um, so here's my uh, power LED flipping and clicking to the front bit. You have to be quite sensitive with this plastic, but it's, it's, nothing's broken so far. And it does take quite a bit of time to um, to get this fitting nicely, and that's the top cover going in, which has actually got AA batteries to retain um, some of the non-volatile memory. So, so that attaches to a blue lead, and then you kind of all hook it along the front together. And it's quite easy to trap the wires for the power LED when you clip it together so there's a lot to look out for so yeah it doesn't really go well it's that's because the top of the GoTech drive bay pushes it out a little bit but yeah that's pretty good and the screws going in each corner there uh, I didn't don't think I show it but there's a volume knob as well that I kind of put on too taken off it fits at the side there so really yeah very nice build actually very well made oh there's the knob going in yet and next up it's called I think it's called the sunroof it is where your um, IS, ISA cards go in ISA cards so there's the sound blaster card going in Sometimes on machines that I've had for eBay, like this one, in fact, some of the times the slots are a bit dirty, so I've had to clean them with a bit of isopropanol alcohol. Uh, there's the XTID card going in. And there is a fourth ISO slot where I could have fitted it, but I prefer to leave it here actually where I can attach it more firmly. And then there's the compact flash. which does take its own power. Now, I can't remember if I fitted the power to it. It does work without the power, interestingly enough. Um, but that's the clicker going into the XCID there. I'm just gonna just screw everything down. But yeah, another example of a really nicely made machine, I think. together well and then the side bit to cover up the side of those cards where you can fit the compact flash etc etc I'm just going to just pop that in a while and that's it it's actually quite a light unit when you pick them up quite surprising and it's not too big either That's the batteries for the real-time clock, etc. So I'm going to uh, set up the machine now, and I'm going to do a fresh install. So here I am plugging in the power supply unit into it because uh, I don't, don't want the original monitor anymore. And then also got the RGB to HDMI plugging into the video port there, uh, turning it on at the power supply. And here it is on the first bit. So I've got the GoTech in here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to select uh, the Amstrad system disk and here it boots and um, this is what it kind of sounds like and it's a very loud PC speaker uh, and now the XTID has been recognized and what I've done is I've changed it to boot from B by pressing the B key on the keyboard and what it's doing is it's, t it's looking at the B drive which is the GoTech and it's making that boot as if it's the A drive um, between the XTID and the Amstrad ROM 
Um, so that's the mouse driver installed off the Amstrad. And here's uh, a listing of what's on the system system disk there. So that's booting from that. Now I didn't have the compact flash installed, but now I'm going to put it in into a slot on the side. And I've got 128 megabyte one there. Um, now this one won't work with the Amstrad uh, version of DOS. I think I keep thinking it's 3.2. Uh, so for that one, you have to install DOS 5 is the earliest DOS that works on anything over 30 megabytes. Um, so here I'm running the MS-DOS 5 installer instead. So again, I've turned it on, and here it's going to boot from the A drive, but I change it to B drive quickly by pressing the B key. And it has found the compact flash in the master position, which is good. Um, so it's just, on uh, that GoTech, I've got a, an LCD screen on it now, which makes things a lot easier. So when you first install it, chances are, like me, um, you're going to need to clear the the original compact flash, maybe you formatted it on a modern machine and it needs to be uh, cleaned off. So exit the installer using the F3 key and then run the F disk. Off the, uh, this is still off the system disk for DOS 5. Uh, have a look at the partition. So in this case I have got, I could have probably reused that one, but I'm going to clear it anyway. So delete the primary DOS, so it might be the, the extended, but I'm going to delete the primary one. <coughs> And then it's basically going to want to reboot now. Now I think I have to keep pressing the B key to get it to boot back off the DOS Fiber installer, but it should go a bit further this time. I've probably sped the things up there a little bit. Um, so yeah, I'm just checking the settings for DOS Five, the date, the time. Um, change the country to UK. Now I'm not sure how much these settings actually apply because I'm going to use some of the Amstrad's own uh, software. But I'll change it anyway. Install to hard drive. Now the bit always catches me in here. Change the shell. Get rid don't want shell basically. Just want to go straight to MS-DOS. And it just restarted itself. So again I have to choose B to go back to the installer. And like I've sped things up, but I put a little time code at the bottom right. So it's pretty quick using a Compact Flash as the hard disk. Um, and then it's basically going to ask me to switch between the three uh, disks. And I use that through the rotary dial on my GoTech to go for the three disks of the DOS 5 installer. And we're almost done. And at this point, if all things work, then it should boot off the compact flash. So hopefully XDID again loads up, and there's the overlay at the top. Uh, it's found the compact flash. And I can hear the clicker now. So here's my boot sequence um, off the vanilla installed DOS 5. There's quite a lot I'd like to configure with this yet though, but that's what it looks like on the C drive. And the first time you do a DIR on the C drive, it takes a little bit longer to return uh, the number of bytes free because of the size of the of the compact flash compared to what it's used to. The old days, there were 10 to 30 megabytes big. Um, so that's kind of giving a bit of a tour of... Um, what I'm doing here is I'm copying some of the Amstrad files over to the C drive, the supplementals from disk C, and also off... Um, the first system disk I'll copy that stuff over as well so you need the keyboard stuff particularly the mouse stuff um, if you install the Amstrad stuff plus 3.2 again you need a small compact flash drive or the original hard drive but it would take care of all this for you whereas with installing DOS 5 you need to manually move this stuff over and um, in auto exec you probably need to do a few corrections as well. Um, I think what I did is originally compared the original Amstrad auto exec with the DOS 5 one. Um, so again the keyboard stuff there would change to use the Amstrad instead. And the 
mouse as well. So what I've done there is I've added Amstrad to the path, and I've added mouse, and I'm just gonna have a look at config.sys. I can't remember if anything in there I change as well. No, I don't think so. Ah, so set there is important. And again, you're going to need to use set there to um, get the keyboard, Amstrad keyboard software to think that you're still running DOS 3.2 instead of DOS 5. But that's it for the basic install. So this is my own build. Uh, just booting up now so I spent a bit of time getting this working how I like it to on a different machine and I've copied it across to the machine I'm working on so uh, various of the boot options this is DOS 5 uh, and I've got Microsoft mouse installed because this mouse is using the serial port instead of the Amstrad mouse uh, when you first do kind of DIR on the C drive it takes air for ages when you first do it when you first boot it up uh, because it's uh, got much more uh, room than the original hard drive. So this is the auto exec bat. I've got various things going on in here. Got a few directories added to the path to make it easier. Uh, Amstrad's still in there, but also got DOS for the uh, DOS five utilities. Q quick filer, Q filer, H break, which I'll come to in a second. Or I've not even referenced it in here, but that's useful for breaking out things without all control delete. And then I've got Word. What else? I've got some uh, Sound Blaster stuff. I've got the I've removed the Microsoft keyboard stuff because I've chosen to use the Amstrad keyboard uh, utilities instead and I've had to use set the to tell it that the keyboard utility for Amstrad, it, that I'm running uh, DOS 3.11 I think it is, or is it 3.2? Uh, and then I've got DOS key as well, which still takes up a bit of room, but it, I like it. And then I've got a few uh, blasts. I'm not sure, yeah, there's the sound blaster stuff there. I'm not sure why I've removed the last one. And finally, I've got the Amstrad mouse driver. Again, I'm not using the, sorry, I'm using a DOS mouse driver rather than an Amstrad mouse driver because I'm using a serial port. So, uh, check disk, I've got about 55, 550 uh, kilobytes free. Uh, when I'm running H-break, that does take a bit more. So H-break is going to show up here in a second. So Control alt c basically leaves any any programs. Here's me using it on Tapper, for example. alt Control delete doesn't normally, well, it doesn't have an escape key. So if I do Control alt c instead of turns to the DOS prompt. So talking about games, here I'm going to load up um, Arkanoid 2. And it's going to be using the Game Blaster audio instead of ad lib because i've got the chip relevant chip in the sound blaster um so here it is on a, an lcd screen through the rgb to hdmi looking great um you'll notice here i've actually upgraded the gotec to one with a display on it as well Very nice and responsive on the Amstrad. I've certainly played it on other systems and it plays much too fast, so it's really nice playing at its proper speed. And it's a yeah, it's a nice game. I don't remember if I play I remember playing this one or Bananoid most, but Bananoid's a VGA version I think. VGA game. And next up, now I've not actually played this before, so I'm looking forward to playing it on the PC1640. Uh, particularly now I've got a mouse that actually clicks, left clicks. And again, it's using the Game Blaster. Now 
now. I think I've got some light scan lines on the monitor here through the uh, RGB to HDMI. You can apply scan lines. I think that they're quite nice light ones here. Which doesn't look that far away from the original CRT for certain games it would be applied. Now the RGB to HDMI reports that this is a CJ image. But I'm pretty sure it is EGA. Go to a bit of a close up here just to show you the scan on options on the RGB to HDMI. So they're under preferences and they're on, and their scan lines levels at 10, which I think means actually the colour is quite high. And did I turn it off just there? I think I did. So I'll turn them on again, and this time. I'm going to drop the colour and the level down of the uh, of the black lines to practically off, and I think I've made it much more pronounced. So this doesn't actually look as good for me with uh, the PC1640. Might look great for consoles and stuff, but. So yeah, now the mouse that I'm using is a serial mouse and I can now left click uh, rather than having to use the Amstrad mouse and hit the return key because of the kind of the weird way the Amstrad mouse works. So I can now left click and it, it kind of works, which is great. Okay, next game, Tapper. I used to love this game when I was a kid. Uh, I still do. I can't remember it being in CJ graphics, but it must have been. Uh, I think this is an old booter. So again, it's quite difficult to leave it back to the DOS prompt. You have to do all control delete, but with H break, you can just leave it. The controls are a little bit tricky because sometimes I kind of lock on. And the next game, round 42. This and Paratrooper are probably my favourite games from being a kid. Now, yeah, on that screen it was cropping uh, the outside, so I've just zoomed in here on a, on a screen capture of it. So I obviously need to configure it a bit more for certain graphics types, but I think round 42 had very particular demands, but it is, yeah, it's a fantastic game. Uh, I think we'll do a close up again in a second. So there are 42 rounds, I think, and uh, the more crazy they get. Great sound. Really well made. And you've got a laser beam there. Very imaginative. What I like is that the more kind of sprites on screen, the more bogged down the processor seems to get, but that kind of adds to the game. Very nice. Too. 
And again, it's not a game you can easily emulate this at all. Uh, the online versions have kind of got a different resolution screen. And I really like the fact that the end gives you some nice statistics. What I like about this actually is I've got it configured so that it will change the monitor from being um, EGA to CGA via a, a bat file rather than having to change the switches on the back of the machine so I can change it so that it leaves that mode afterwards. So here I'm loading up uh, Commander Keen, probably the most demanding game I think I've tried on it just to see if it works. And it, yeah, it mostly works okay, it's a bit slow in some places but I've tried most of the Commander Keen, only the first three episodes uh, from the first series um, work. But it's still pretty impressive. So yeah, it's a bit screwed up on the sound there. But actually controls aren't a problem at all. It's just the sound just at that part. Now I think I did capture the sound separately for this part of the video. So it doesn't match up to the movements unfortunately, but you get the idea. difficult finding the fire button, you have to press control and alt at the same time. And then finally, uh, just some software, but Qfiler is a, is a nice kind of Norton file manager type program. My dad used to use it anyway. And I like the fact you can launch it from anywhere if you add it to your auto exec as a path. And yeah, it's a, just very straightforward to use. So that's it.